As far back as I can remember, I have been totally in love with words. My earliest memories are of savoring language. I had a very intense relationship with words. Um, and so I would sit and think about certain words all day long. And it wasn't just the sound of the word, it was also the shape, the spatial dimension, the color, the texture, the flavor. I had a multi-sensory experience of language and was infatuated from, I guess, the time I was exposed to language from my first days on the planet. As I grew up, I realized that that's not how most people thought about language and that a lot of the language you encounter day to day is sort of deadening. And I think it was upon realizing that that I began a search that resulted in my discovering poetry. And there aren't that many poets who seem to me to be uh, at the highest level of managing the multi-sensory experience of language. But when I found Dylan Thomas, I knew that I had found a poet. It was very clear to me from the first few lines I looked at that he was thinking about language that way, experiencing language that way. I don't think that Dylan Thomas was much on grand meanings. I think that he was big on moments, beginnings of meaning, flickerings into provisional meaning. And certainly I think he experienced some sadness as he reflected on the drivers of that breaking down of meaning and structures of meaning in modern life. I mean, he was born the year that the Great War began. He lived through the Second World War. He saw all kinds of changes in Western society. He saw a lot of disturbing developments in modern life. He was alive during the time of the so-called death of God. I think religious faith was difficult for him. So I think his insistence on focusing on a beautiful, if idiosyncratically beautiful, type of moment is related to his sense that the early 20th century was not a good time for large, grand structures of meaning. I think he was mistrustful of that. He allows himself and encourages the reader to allow himself the pleasure of language, which is the which is the vessel of meaning, because the meaning itself had been emptied out. Religions, governmental structures, every kind of source of meaning had been called into question, in some cases utterly emptied out of meaning. And so what you have left is the vessel of meaning, which is language itself. And Dylan, Dylan Thomas says, let's make that as beautiful and pleasurable as possible, what else do we have? And that's an interesting response to what was going on in the early 20th century. Hello, thank you all for coming out tonight and uh, thanks to the Allen Public Library, Tom, Kevin, Michael, everybody for having me. It's a joy to be here to talk about one of my favorite poets. As far back as I can remember, my greatest delight has been in words. My earliest memories are of savoring language. I remember lying in bed as a boy, overcome with gratitude for the bliss of words, realizing this was something no one could ever take away from me, realizing there was nothing I could buy or not buy, nothing I could be given or denied that would bring me so much pleasure as words. And this highest pleasure, amazingly, was automatic, unstruggled for. I couldn't believe what words made happen in my mind without my trying for these effects at all. Often when people talk about poetry or the glory of language in general, they talk about the sounds of words. But this has always seemed curious to me, focusing only on sound robs words of their manifold magnificence. Sound is important, of course, but to me, words have always been so much more than sound. A word I love, whether said into the air or only in the mind, activates a kind of 
multi-sensory experience, a Porphyro's banquet, actually more than that, a kind of non-representational sculpture I can hold and touch and eat, but that no matter how many times it is eaten remains to be enjoyed again. The fantasy that one could miraculously have his cake and eat it too applies perfectly well to words. Words are blessed little prelapsarian Edens. I'm not talking about something that one arrives at by contemplation or close study. I'm talking about an intense, automatic event in the imagination that a word triggers. Days and days, whole days of my childhood, were blessedly spent delighting in words. I would become obsessed with a word like Swiss or tap or dot and do little all day except to love it with my whole being. I especially loved small one-syllable words and the fewer letters the better. The magical many monosyllables like small flying saucers, logos becoming logos, were like whole vast planets and somehow tiny toys at the same time. They are paradoxes of hugeness and smallness and nothing could be more blessed. When I was first learning words, I assumed everyone else was enjoying them as I was and that whatever stultifying communicational imperatives might intrude, the main purpose of all speech must be to share in the pleasure of words. That is for human beings to delight each other with the colors, shapes, spatial dimensions, textures, and tastes of syllables. When I was acquiring language and other people were talking to me, I experienced dazzlements of every kind in the brain. But I noticed that often people chose to combine words in ways that obscured their magical powers and properties. And this baffled me. Why not foreground the delight? Why hide it under a bushel? Being obsessed with words is the dominant memory of my childhood. I remember so many moments so vividly. In seventh grade grammar class, my teacher, Miss Luann Burge, said the word play and I thought I would die of delight. All I could think about for the rest of the day was the word play. I wanted to be that word. I wanted my whole life to be that word. I loved it so much, the way it tasted and looked and felt and sounded. In some ways, I was out of touch and in a kind of la-la land of my own imagination. But by this time in my life, I was starting to realize that maybe not everyone was going around loving language every minute of every day. I noticed that very few texts, if any, seemed to have been written for the primary purpose of getting words to be and do optimally beautiful things. Around this time, in maybe the eighth grade or so, I discovered Dylan Thomas, and his poetry changed my life. So much so that in a few years, when I was an exchange student in England and had enough money to make only one literary pilgrimage, I chose to go to Swansea, Wales, his hometown, and breathe the world he breathed. From the first few lines of Dylan Thomas' poetry that I ever read, it could not have been clearer that this man cared more about words' beauty than about any other of their properties. Words were beautiful in isolation, but combined as they were in Thomas's work, they became more beautiful because their effects were synergistic. The words overlapped and changed each other. Colors mixed. Shapes combined and shaded into one another. Tastes and textures interacted just so. I had never experienced anything so satisfying and I felt I had found a friend. This account plays into the hands of Thomas's detractors, who are many, and who frequently dismiss his poetry as a mere adolescent indulgence every teenager's favorite poetic delight to be discarded in adulthood for poems of greater depth, complexity, and maturity. I have a feeling this is why Tom had trouble finding anybody to talk about Dylan Thomas. He's not particularly in vogue among academics. Dylan the drunkard looms so large in our communal memory that he often overshadows Dylan the poet. In a 1978 essay titled Dylan Thomas and Public Suicide, the famous American poet Donald Hall serves up a devastating account of Thomas's hideous behavior at a Harvard party in 1950 when the poet was 35 and only three and a half 
years from his death. I don't know if it was clear to y'all from that video, but he, he basically drank himself to death. And he was just run ragged from his uh, very strenuous reading schedule. He was on a reading tour in the United States. He died in New York City. Hall, Donald Hall, offers a balanced picture of Dylan's complex personality, showing that he could be irresistibly delightful as well as insufferable company. Hall admits that when he was in his early to mid-twenties, he considered Thomas to be a great poet. But in 1978, when he's writing the essay, and when Hall was 50 years old, his judgment of Thomas's work was quite harsh. His arguments against Thomas are thin and wrong-headed, and I can't help thinking, given how smart Donald Hall is, that in the guise of faulting Thomas's way of writing, Hall was really faulting Thomas's way of living. There's a strangely moralistic flavor to many lambastings of Thomas's work, and this is certainly true of Hall's critique. I will read you the key portions here. Hall writes that in Dylan's handsome stanzas, the words watch themselves in the mirror and the words love what they see. This, I take it, means that Hall finds Thomas's poetry narcissistic and self-indulgent. It is okay for Whitman, the American poet Walt Whitman, to sing of himself right down to admiring the smell of his armpits, but for Thomas to take and help his readers take unabashed delight in language, that is apparently out of bounds. Discussing a Thomas masterpiece, Hall writes, when we cut through the glorious vegetation of Fern Hill, we see that the soil and rock underneath are commonplace. It was pleasant for a city child to come to the country on his summer vacation, then he grew up. That's Hall's summing up of the poem. This criticism is remarkably uncharitable and misleading. Yes, the story of Fern Hill is commonplace, much like that of Hall's uh, celebrated Names of Horses, a poem I love, though not nearly so much as I love Fern Hill. Many great poems tell simple, common stories and express common human emotion. It is the way they tell these stories and express these emotions, or the ways, that makes the poems great. What does Hall want? A poem that advances superstring theory or triggers an exotic emotion never before experienced by human beings? Hall speaks of cutting through the glorious vegetation of Fern Hill, but who in his right mind would want to do that? Earlier I mentioned that at some point in my childhood I realized people weren't using words primarily to delight each other. I can't explain to you what a huge letdown this was for me, but before I realized the mundanity and deadness of some of the daily language we encountered, there was an excitement in learning words when I was absorbing the mystery of language, and there was a moment when I thought the world was a linguistic paradise whose dwellers were all constantly dreaming up new ways to delight each other with words. I thought that learning more about other people's everyday use of language would exclusively heighten and never undermine my pleasure. During this period of time, I would often make mistakes, thinking I was hearing something much more interesting than had actually been said. I think this is common with children. My good friend Johnny Wink, who teaches English at Washtenaw Baptist, University told me once that his little son, Gene, once spoke of mystics in the oven, triggering visions for Johnny of martyred seers when really it was biscuits, not mystics. This is the type of thing that happens when you mishear song lyrics and cherish your mistaken version, only to learn later that the actual lyrics are far less interesting. My good buddy, the terrific poet Elijah Burrell, writes down his misapprehensions of song lyrics in a notebook and then uses them in his poems. After all, he made them up. In Sea of Love, a song by a band called The National, there's a line, I see you're rushing now. Elijah heard, I see you are Russian, as in from Russia now, which in the context of the song makes for a very interesting line. To my ear, Thomas's poetry reclaims these kinds of happy mishearings as the authoritative versions. In Fern Hill, as in many other Thomas poems, I sometimes catch banal 
formulations lurking threateningly just behind some of the most delightful phrases. For example, windfall light, which is a striking, wonderful phrase, could easily have been the much less interesting wonderful light. Elsewhere in the poem, we get pebbles and holy in the same line, suggesting to my auditory imagination, holy Bible. But who wants a holy Bible in a poem when he could have a holy pebble instead? Simply because the holy pebble is new and interesting. We've heard of the holy Bible. Fern Hill is written in syllabics, meaning that the lines have set numbers of syllables. And John Wilkinson, whom we heard from earlier, points out that on the prosodic level, the chains... Thomas sings in uh, at the end of, as he says he does at the end of Fern Hill, are the poem's formal constraints, the rules, if you will, of the form. You, you may recall that in the poem he said, uh, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. Wilkinson argues convincingly that any accusation that Thomas is a sloppy, undisciplined, or slapdash poet is simply unfounded and ridiculous. Certain of Thomas's more charitable critics suggest that when he goes wrong, the problem is not that he's sloppy and undisciplined, but rather that his language is so compressed, so strange, so dense with meaning, that it is inscrutable. In effect, extremely charming mumbo jumbo. Dickey is delighted by Thomas's eccentricity, whereas Hall seems to find it superficially enjoyable for a moment and then distracting and annoying later. Hall writes, Dylan never put his poetry in service to anything outside himself except the muse. He served the muse. He wrote pure poetry. But what is pure poetry pure of? It is pure of thought and pure of feeling, pure of vision, pure of enlarged consciousness, its only emotion is love for words. The alcoholic, Lewis Hyde says, cannot go outside himself, lacks compassion and empathy, loses spirit by drowning under spirits. The immediate pivot here from criticizing Thomas for being a limited poet to being a selfish alcoholic is telling. What is Hall really finding fault with, Thomas or Thomas's work? I respect Hall as a poet and critic, but if he can read Thomas's work and find no evidence of thought, feeling, or vision, I can only say that I feel sorry for him. He is missing out on what Thomas's more appreciative readers find in abundance in his work and are deeply thankful for. Sometimes part of the formula for literary greatness is that a poet's particular gifts and predilections perfectly match the demands of his historical moment. And so we might ask the question, what does Dylan Thomas's fascination with and feel for words have to do with the historical moment he's writing in and his larger concerns, his thematic concerns? I do think that Thomas is a case of gifts matching historical moment. He was born the year the First World War began and then lived through the second. Predicting the poetry of our own moment, Thomas's vision is that of the inadequacy and falseness of visions, particularly totalizing visions, visions that try to make, bring, bring the world under a rule. If Thomas's most obscure poems were being written and published for the first time today, they would still be seen as cutting edge, would probably, probably be released by an avant-garde uh, house like Fence, Night Boat, or Canarium down in Marfa, and would be even more challenging than most of those presses' other titles being released today. They would be challenging because, as Dickey says, the inventiveness of Thomas's language is unique to him. It is nothing we can understand as a function of recent theories or manifestos. And there's delight, not just a Marxist or deconstructionist point, in his cancellations of conventional meaning, his subversions of our expectations as to how a poem should behave. And contrary to critical consensus, or something approaching consensus sometimes, depending on the critical vogues of the moment, Thomas knows what he's doing. He, in fact, tells us what he's doing. 
he writes it right into his poems. Consider, for example, the poem, Was There a Time? I don't have a recording of Thomas reading this, so I'll read it. It's a very short poem. Was there a time? Was there a time when dancers with their fiddles in children's circuses could stay their troubles? There was a time they could cry over books, but time has set its maggot on their track. Under the arc of the sky, they are unsafe. What's never known is safest in this life. Under the sky signs, they who have no arms have cleanest hands. And as the heartless ghost alone, unhurt, so the blind man sees best. Especially when the October wind blows in, bringing the first deadly rumors of winter, Thomas wishes to give us the gift of beauty within non-meaning. Non-meaning is not exactly right, but a deliberate refusal of a clear panoramic view of things. In phrases like punishes the land and the coming fury, and in was there a time language like under the arc of the sky they are unsafe, and under the sky signs they that have no arms have cleanest hands, we might see evidence of a calamity larger than the end of the year. Thomas lived in a turbulent, war-torn time. The world was undergoing almost unimaginable cataclysm. His response is radical, and before its time, before our time even, in a sense, he gives the reader heartless words, a meaning that's safe because it's never known, and he advocates being blind because the blind man sees best. What happens in Thomas's most challenging poems is that meanings begin beautifully to be born and then withdraw, giving way to the beautiful birth of a new meaning, which then withdraws and gives way. With a cumulative effect of delight by endless beginning, endless becoming, in altar-wise by owl light, we have a very difficult poem, and it's a longish poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read you a couple of sections from it and then say something about it, because I think it's a model of some of his most difficult poetry. Death is all metaphors, shape in one history. The child that sucketh long is shooting up, the planet ducted pelican of circles weans on an artery the gender strip, child of the short spark in a shapeless country, soon sets alight a long stick from the cradle. And then one other section. Now stamp the Lord's Prayer on a grain of rice, a Bible leaved of all the written woods stripped to this tree, a rocking alphabet, Genesis in the root, the scarecrow word, and one light's language in the book of trees, doom on deniers at the wind-turned statement, times tune my ladies with the teats of music, the scaled seesaws fix in a naked sponge who sucks the bell-voiced atom out of magic. Time, milk, and magic from the world beginning. Time is the tune my ladies lend their heartbreak from bald pavilions and the house of bread. Time tracks the sound of shape on man and cloud on rose and icicle, the ringing handprint. Thomas here not only performs this dodging of sustained meaning, but in a meta move acknowledges that he is doing all this and why, thereby achieving sneakily the larger meaning of non-meaning. An important implication of Thomas's more difficult poetry is that in a time of unbearable horror, an age when old gods are dying and old structures of meaning are crumbling, large visions are spurious, inadequate, deserving of our deepest skepticism, and maybe most important, psychologically dangerous. If Moses of Exodus can live 
only by not facing the face of God. Dylan Thomas's poetic persona can live only by not facing its absence. The speaker in Alterwise by Owlite cannot bring himself not to hear the scraping of Christ, even if the God seems to be no God at all, and to come from nowhere, bringing no eternally salvific tidings. Because the speaker can neither believe nor disbelieve, his thinking must be in brief bursts, hopeful but abortive, the beginning of something that can be neither sustained nor ignored. The poet is the child of the short spark in a shapeless country. That is, he is all flickers of faith with no discernible larger structure. Here Thomas prefigures language poetry. When I speak of larger structures, I mean of meaning, not of poetic form. Here Thomas prefigures language poetry and the post-avant poetry of our present moment. Thomas wrung our weathering changes, understood the brevity of a wick of words, embraced one light's language, knowing that the light was always changing, even within a single poem, and confessed in a wondrous moment of synesthesia that time tracks the sound of shape on man and cloud, on rose and icicle, the ringing handprint. The handprint fades, the icicle melts, and the rose wilts. But Thomas does something much weirder and more inventive than to confess the provisionality of meaning. Unlike T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound and most of the so-called postmodern poets who followed them, Thomas allows himself and allows us to enjoy thoroughly that short spark that is all we have of meaning. The odd phrase, odd in both senses, the odd line, the beautiful mangled moment, even as the maggot eats away at everything. Hall concludes his essay by saying that Thomas never found the enlarging, enhancing wisdom that is poetry's real wickedness and real salvation. Since when is wisdom the defining element of poetry? Poems are made not of wisdoms, but of words. Hall wants Thomas's language to present a large meaning unassumingly. Thomas's language fires back and says, but in an age when meaning is breaking down, the words themselves, the vessels of meaning, if not the meaning itself, are what we have. Let us enjoy them. The words aren't dancing in the mirror. They are dancing for all of us while the ship goes down because it's going down anyway and the words know it. There is great generosity in this and a radical urge toward enjoyment even if the only thing left to enjoy is the flavor of our doom. Let me close by returning to Hall's risibly misapplied metaphor of vegetation. The poetry reader's job is not to hack away the glorious vegetation of a poem to find the rock of wisdom underneath it, some portable meaning, but rather to love the vegetation and love it with the whole being, the mind, the body, everything, the spirit. I do not say all great poems are wise, but any wisdom to be found in a poem, and there is certainly a wild sort of wisdom in Thomas, grows uniquely there, inseparable from its once in a universe vegetation, alive in the green views. Thank you. Any questions, comments, or protests? Let me bring the microphone to you so we can get the question on tape. This is your time to protest, question, and think. Tell me where uh, he felt like he got his muse from. Uh, in other words, you know, we're, we're, like you said, we're not trying to dissect the man, but we, did he feel like he got it from his, all his pain and suffering in his life or, or that he just, uh, that was a part of his creation? It's hard to say. It is said that he was a sickly child, but he didn't have, from what I can tell, a particularly unhappy childhood. And really, 
the whole performance of the poet self came along after he had found his poetic voice. I think it can't be attributed to the suffering that went along with the alcoholic binges and the horrible hangovers. He did, he did have horrible hangovers with four or five day headaches when the merest hint of light would crack his skull. So he, he, he wound up with plenty of grief, but during those days when he was miserable and alcoholic, he was writing like one poem every, uh, like one poem a year, or something like that. The last decade of his life, I think he wrote a poem a year, or something like that. And he wrote the larger part of his corpus, what we think of as the Dolan Thomas canon, when it comes to lyric poems, I think by the time he was 20. He was writing durable poems, poems that we still read and that are still widely anthologized in his teens, you know, from the age of like 15 to 20. Amazing. Questions? And, and in fact, someone, uh, I read or saw a video of this, said that early on he was acting out drunkenness. A lot of times uh, this, this woman said they'd be walking along in he, the street in the city and he would be perfectly sober, but when his friends would come up, he would begin acting drunk. Questions, comments? Why did he turn to alcohol? Well, he does seem to have been invested in, you know, the myth of the disheveled, drunken poet. And he, I think, genuinely enjoyed the pub. He liked compa that kind of companionship. He loved to hold forth and tell stories. Catlin and others, I think, would say that he wanted to be thought of that way. And, and it may be that it's just the opposite of what the gentleman in the back was wondering might be the case. It may be that the pain and suffering that went along with alcoholism um, didn't inspire the poems but the pain and suffering of writing poems and caused him to drink a lot because uh, as Catlin pointed out, he would sit in his study from like t uh, four, hour, you know, four hours a day, sometimes five, and he might, as she said, write two lines, and he corroborates this, Dylan Thomas will, will, said this on many occasions, he may write, write two lines. That, that was a good day. Some days it may be I took one word out or put one word in. You know, four or five hours. And then he would just go to the pub and get drunk. So I think maybe the the strain of, of writing those kinds of poems drove him to drink. That's just speculation. A couple questions. Where did he go to college, number one? And uh, secondly, you didn't mention anything about his father. Was he an influence in his life? And uh, thirdly, was there anyone, anything in his background uh, that led him to, to go to become a poet? Yeah, and I, I'm glad you asked about the father. The father was important. Um, when Dylan Thomas was four years old, his dad would read Shakespeare to him. And his mother, who really pampered him, would say, don't read Shakespeare to him. He's four years old. And the dad said, he'll, he'll remember something. He'll get something from this. And this comes back to something I said in my lecture. Um, there's something magical about hearing magical sounding language that you, can't, that you don't understand. It's like when you're in a foreign country and you hear the people speaking a language you don't know. There's something magical about it. There's something alluring uh, in the sound of language that you don't know the meanings of. And I think that Dylan Thomas's hearing Shakespeare when he was four years old might have helped him be uh, okay with delighting in language that he couldn't make logical sense of. And that may have transferred into his writing because he also allows himself to put things down on paper and, and allows himself to publish those things that don't really track logically. You can't make easy logical sense of a Dylan Thomas poem the way you can, you know, a Philip Larkin poem. So I think I think that's 
that's one way in which the father was a huge influence. And the father had a, had a good library, and Dylan Thomas read a lot of uh, classic English literature in his father's library. And he continues to love those things that he found early. Hardy, Yeats, um, uh, I think Sidney was in, in that library. And he also liked the uh, North Carolina writer Thomas Wolfe, which makes perfect sense to me. They, I think they have a lot in common, actually. Um, so where did I go to college? I did undergrad at Washita Baptist in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, which is only about, I think, four hours away. And I did my grad work at Ole Miss over in Oxford, Mississippi. And, and did he go to college is what I was asking as well. Oh, you were asking about Dylan Thomas. Where did he uh, go if he did go? Uh, he did not. He attended grammar school and, um, in, in Swansea. His dad wanted him to go to college. But he, he didn't want to do that. He thought he was ready to go. And he was, he was already publishing. His first book uh, was published very early. And he was writing poems that we still love and cherish today. So I guess maybe he knew best. Although one wonders what would have become of him if he had gone to the university, how, how that would have changed him. Is there any evidence that he had contact or knowledge of the Dada movement? Because Dada dealt with words that didn't necessarily have to make sense, and they could be put together any way they, that the poet or artist wanted it to. Did he have any knowledge of he, that? that he you know did. Of? He okay. did. He never allowed himself to be annexed by the surrealist uh, movement, but he was aware of it. His, my theory is, surrealism was native to his imagination. It, I think Dickey is on to something when he talks about that. He says, Dylan Thomas writes that way because he's really like that. I, I love the way Dickey says it. Dickey may be a little naive in, in the way he describes the process because we know that Dylan Thomas really, really struggled in the, in the workroom to get those lines that, that are so scintillating. But um, I do think that Dylan Thomas's mind just moved in a way that that we later can stand back and call surrealist, and I think that he may have been influenced in some way by the surrealist exhibitions that he attended, and I, and I know that he went to one. But he he had his own way of doing it. So his surrealism seems less programmatic to me than even a lot of the Langpo that we've seen in this country in the last thirty forty years and. Uh, some of the so-called post-avant poetry, which does seem to proceed from theories about how language works. I never get the sense that anything in Dylan Thomas is coming out of a theory. As, as Dickey, I think, wisely says, his, he arrives at his, um, what does he say? Uh, oh, he says, Hart Crane is a very original poet, but he arrives at his originality through theory whereas Thomas arrives at his through the viscera. And I, I think there's something to that. Do you think our culture has uh, caricatured him, or do you think the things that he's remembered for are, are a, a good spectrum of who he actually was? Well, I do think that this uh, version of him that his friends called Instant Dylan, the the poet in performance at the pub has overshadowed uh, a lot of the other elements of his identity and, and certainly overshadowed the poetry at times. But you know, uh, kind of combining your question with the last question, let me say this. Catlin said in one of those clips that she sometimes wondered whether he ever got past his childhood. And this is, a, this is a charge that you see critics making, too. Oh, he's obsessed with childhood. He's so sentimental. He can't get past his childhood. But see, y'all know from talking to children that they often do things with language that could be characterized as surrealistic uh, or experimental. And also, people, when they're sleep-talking, will, will just spontaneously generate language that, that, could, pass as, that could pass for avant-garde poetry. Most people allow the apparatuses of censorship um, and personality editing that are 
uh, clamp down on us as we grow up to kind of push them away from that kind of playfulness with language. Dylan Thomas never let that happen to him. And so there's a sense in which his attachment to childhood is a strength of his when it comes to writing poetry because he stays in touch with that child mind, the, the native surrealism of the child's mind. And so I often think that that criticism is coming out of envy or, or, or just um, a limitation on the, on the part of the critic. So I think he has been misunderstood in that way as well. But yeah, all the drunkenness and bad behavior at parties has overshadowed his poetry sometimes. And the same thing, incidentally, has happened to James Dickey, who, who idolized Dylan Thomas and was rather his match when it comes to bad behavior at parties. Thank you all for coming.